there. Hi, everybody. Hello. Happy Friday. Happy every day. Every day is a great day. We hope you're doing well. My name is James Marin. I'm an integrative registered dietitian, environmental nutritionist. I'm Dahlia Marin, registered dietitian, nutritionist. And we are here back another ah. week to talk more all about SIBO. All it about is SIBO. One of our passions, one of the things that we are just so determined to help people get to the bottom of and really understand. And it's really difficult to get to the bottom of an issue if you don't fully understand it. So we really want to give you this in-depth look into what SIBO is and an opportunity to get more information. And if you're new, so this is our, our good gut group gets to ask questions live. We're seeing their questions as they come in, mm -hmm. if, they, if they have questions. Um, the rest of you are watching this maybe elsewhere, so it's great to have you. You can click below for more information. If you're not seeing it yet, it'll be there after this live. Um, so check back. Um, and if you haven't already watched our old, watch our old videos, they were um, really informative. We're covering a lot of topics as they deal with SIBO and IBS. Today, we will be discussing the three types of SIBO getting into, you know, yeah, there could be different types of SIBO, not just like not all of us are the same. So we shouldn't be all treated the same like cookie cutters. SIBO is different and unique. So even as we dive deeper and peel back these layers, we're going to see a lot of detail that is important to know, right? And we're in an exciting time now. Last time we spoke two weeks ago, we talked all about different testing for SIBO. Mm -hmm. And we talked about how just a couple months ago, the newest updated type of test, which we do run for patients, mm -hmm. it is available to now test for the three known types of SIBO or bacterial overgrowth. We're not there quite yet with a breath test for fungal overgrowth, but right. we're excited that we can offer that third type of mm -hmm. testing for clients because sometimes it helps clarify things. They might have yeah. gotten a negative test when they took the older tests and we'll talk about why that is today mm -hmm. but we recommend definitely going back finding out more if you are kind of having some of these symptoms we talked about symptoms we'll talk also about the symptoms that can sometimes be associated with different types of SIBO today so maybe i mean before we get into three types we'll maybe back up a little bit and say so when we're assessing the three types what are we assessing in those three types oh yeah <laughs> we are so when a patient comes to us and they are present with some of these symptoms we're trying to get to the bottom of them of course there is a, a component of dysbiosis imbalance of microbes within the intestines so we're trying to assess what drives that get to the root cause of what's going on and then yeah move on and figure out is there some type of imbalance is there some type of bacterial overgrowth or microbial overgrowth within that Right. And so and so with these three types, what we're assessing is the gas mm -hmm. essentially given off. And so that's what categorizes yes. these three types. So um, really cool. And that's where we're getting to the breath testing. So definitely go back and watch on the diagnostic and the testing. That's important. And that'll give you a little bit more clarity into this, which is the three types. So what are those? three types. So oh, the yeah. three currently known of types of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or it can even be um, overgrowth of these in the large intestine. So in, mm. in intestinal microbial overgrowth are hydrogen, methane, and hydrogen sulfide. And these mm. are not only produced by bacteria. We know that methane overabundance is produced by archaea. So mm. there is most predominantly a particular type of meth methane overgrowth, Methanobacter smithii, that usually is overabundant. But again, these overgrowth are going to pass off additional and elevated amounts of gas. So right. that is what the testing does, whether it is small bowel aspirate or breath test, we're trying to assess, is there too much gas being, produ being produced? Is that mm. why you're so gassy and bloated? Is that why you've had a change in bowel habits? And depending on the type of SIBO that you have, your symptoms may appear a little bit different. Right. So yeah, that's cool. We'll dive right in. Yeah, let's dive right in. And, and I mean, it's so cool. I mean, we don't always think of like, wow, our little microbes are giving up gases and they're doing all this cool stuff. And it takes you back to like junior high science, right? Of like <laughs> anaerobic and aerobic um, um, digestion and, and the cells, right? Aerobic and anaerobic. So with oxygen, without oxygen. And, you know, that's why we breathe. That's, we're like these 
we're like these large microbes, right? We're mm -hmm. inhaling and exhaling and our little microbes are doing the same thing. They are breaking down materials, they are breathing, they are using oxygen and it's it's so cool. We have like this little universe inside of us. So it's so important to understand what the heck is going on with that universe. Yes, and it's so important also to understand these are friends, they're not foe, right? It's an overabundance of microbes. It's not an overabundance most of the time of pathogenic microbes. Right. So these are just, our regular bacterial species or you know microbial species they're archaea they might be viruses and they are sometimes just over abundant they're mm -hmm. kind of overgrown they're doing too much of their regular thing sometimes in the wrong place so these programs that really focus on kill 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 and just put you on antimicrobial after antimicrobial right. without really seeking to get to the root and help you figure out why it's happening do you need work on motility pelvic floor muscles anything else and also understanding how dysbiosis can not only be managed by taking antibiotics or even herbal antimicrobials. Diet is a huge component in that to mm. feeding healthy microbes and trying to kind of rebalance some of these things involves more than just taking an antibiotic or an antimicrobial. Yes. And for those wondering, I'm sure we, we always get this question of what we're drinking and eating if we're doing that. <laughs> this is kombucha and I put um, frozen strawberries in there because it's hot today. So I'm getting a nice cold beverage. Yeah. That's why I get my... Not necessarily a SIBO friendly beverage. So if you're yes. wondering that and you do have SIBO, I would not recommend drinking kombucha. It is fermented. So until your SIBO has been eradicated, we recommend avoiding things like probiotics and fermented beverages. And but... And down the line, so we're going live every other Friday. Down the line, we're going to get into what we do like with nutrition and, and get into that answer more of, of course, our good gut questions and uh, and get into that. So stay tuned. Make sure you're subscribed. Mm -hmm. Make sure you are uh, hitting the like and commenting down below um, with some of that you want to see. Yeah. All right. So, so let's, let's dive right in. Yeah. What are the three types of microbial overgrowth? What are the three types of organisms that can be producing excess gas? Let's talk about the most common and most overabundant, which is hydrogen dominant SIBO. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing bacteria that are hydrogen producers. What are the symptoms of hydrogen dominant SIBO? And again, keep in mind, this is a type of IBS. So it's not mm -hmm. uncommon for somebody with IBS to have changes in stool. They might have diarrhea, they might have constipation. With hydrogen dominant SIBO in particular, those with this overabundance are more likely to have diarrhea. So it is more likely to cause more rapid transit in the gastrointestinal tract, more likely to cause somebody to have diarrhea. And you might see, experience full on diarrhea where you're passing almost water-like stool. Mm -hmm. It might be just very loose stool that has undigested food in it. Anytime you are having diarrhea, if it is accompanied by mucus and blood, that is definitely a cause for pause and a time where you are gonna reach out to your care team to make sure that they don't recommend you get additional testing for anything like inflammatory bowel disease as well. Mm -hmm. So with SIBO generally, you should not be passing blood and mucus unless it's hemorrhoid type of blood, but you shouldn't be seeing bright red, fresh blood filling the toilet bowl definitely right. seek intervention so for this again mo most it's most common they estimate that about 50 percent or more of SIBO cases end up being hydrogen type SIBO and it honestly tends to be a little bit easier to treat so change in diet you know usually antimicrobials and a couple of other tweaks can do the trick with this right and speaking of change in diet, for those of you in the group and, and working with us one on one, you know, it is it is that low and slow. It's mm -hmm. understanding, look, your, your diarrhea isn't going to go away just like that. If you're dealing with a hydrogen dominant form, you know, it's not just like, oh, I, I started working with Dahlia and tomorrow I'm all my diarrhea is going to be gone and all my bloating is going to be gone. Everything's going to be great. No, it, it takes time. You are restructuring and repopulating your microbiome in some areas uh, in some ways. So it's important to take that time. And speaking of that, that's really why we have our group too. It can be hard to work with your practitioner one-on-one -on -one yeah. and expect that constant daily communication with them. Mm -hmm. it, it becomes really hard when it you have is. hundreds of patients and you know yeah. they want to send you messages each day. That is why we formed our group. So not only we could be here as support and help more than one person mm -hmm. at the same time, but in our group, we find this amazing collective that starts to happen where group members start to help one another. So if 
anything, we highly recommend working with a practitioner who can really help you get to the bottom of things and is able to offer more robust support. Totally. And we not only support hydrogen overabundance, hydrogen SIBO, again, we also help our patients determine if they have methane overabundance. So again, it's not necessarily bacteria because methane comes from, is produced from archaea, which mm -hmm. are, you know, ancient species in our microbiome. They say that it even predates human cells, archaea pro possibly predate dinosaurs. So really, Crazy. really, really ancient microbes. So they, mm. they've been here, they've stuck around. Mm. And we often see when they are overabundant in the gut, they can be a little bit more difficult to treat. With methane overabundance, what we find a couple different things. We find patients usually have constipation, although they sometimes have alternating constipation and diarrhea. Mm -hmm. With methane overabundance, sometimes hydrogen overabundance gets missed because interestingly, these methanogens, they consume hydrogen gas. So maybe you did a breath test. Their practitioner tells you, nope, there's no hydrogen here. You're not, you don't have any hydrogen SIBO. Maybe you do, and maybe your methane was so high and the those methanogens were consuming all your hydrogen, so it made it look like you didn't have hydrogen. But again, usually if it's only methane, you just have constipation. If it's both methane and hydrogen, you might be experiencing that alternating constipation and diarrhea. Mm -hmm. And again, because they are so ancient, they really have established themselves, they can be a little bit more difficult to eradicate at times. They are more likely to bounce back. And patients who have this methane overproduction, very interestingly, we tend to see as well that they are involved in cholesterol metabolism and cholesterol mm. production. So mm -hmm. with this type, I'm always vigilant about helping my patients manage their cholesterol as well and understand why their cholesterol might be high. It might be because of their microbiome. And this, I mean, we can go so deep. I, I almost, I mean, it's, it's so cool. I mean, this goes back to the interconnection this community that our body is and that we are with one another and it's so cool to see the the connections between the liver because technically when you think of cholesterol you're thinking liver and your gut is so connected to your liver when you're talking about digestion when you're talking about bile when you're talking about your gallbladder it's it's all connected with the liver and gallbladder and your small intestine large intestine they are they are a family they're a tight unit and it's all kind of stuck together with this mesentery system inside of your body and there's constant communication going on. So I know we've all been educated in some way, shape or form of like, look, there are these compartments like, no, you have high cholesterol, you're in this group. Oh, you have SIBO, you're in this group and that, but really there, there's quite a mix. We're all kind of overlapping and, and really we create those compartments so we can minimize confusion a little bit. It helps us better understand this complex body going on. So really cool stuff. Yeah, and I read actually recently a really interesting study that they did on methane production. Mm -hmm. And it was actually a study on children. And they mm. found that children who consumed m higher amounts of dairy in their diet, Ooh. in this particular study, it was organic milk and organic yogurt, had higher prevalence of these methane producers in mm. their diet. It's pretty standard practice for most GIs who are, you know, versed or a dietitian who you see, if a patient is experiencing constipation, you think inflammation. Mm -hmm. And we know not only high fat dairy is going to irritate the lining of the gut because mm -hmm. of the saturated fat content, it also can induce production of something called TMAO, which is an inflammatory molecule in the intestines mm -hmm. and outside of the intestines that's irritation, that's inflammation. And it also then is going to feed this constipating microbe in the gut. So for your care team, when they are recommending you should try to avoid dairy for constipation, there are many, many reasons behind this. We can go so deep guys, there's so much to talk about, but yeah, yes. so cool. So we, we did hydrogen, we did methane, and then there's within that hydrogen category, hydrogen sulfide. So mm -hmm. that that rounds out three different types. So and, and yeah. last little point because you guys mm -hmm. know I just love to tell you all the things um, <laughs> with methane production. Interestingly, there also have been some studies done where they prescribe statins, and the statins were able to help lower some of these archaea and some of this methane production in addition to other treatments. So again, there's 
everything is so interconnected whenever we think, oh, you know, I'm just going to see someone for my gut and they're only talking about your gut. You always want to think, what else am I missing? What other organs might be involved with what is going on? Yeah. So with those methane, those methanogens, it can be a little bit more stubborn, but it's not impossible. It definitely can be done. Yeah. So addressing other root causes. And that brings us then to our last type of SIBO. We have hydrogen sulfide right. SIBO. Like I had mentioned in the beginning, we recently, just in October, this test became available. So, mm -hmm. for, you know, that's just six months ago. Okay. And before that, practitioners were really going, one, based on symptoms. Mm -hmm. The most telltale symptom of hydrogen sulfide SIBO is that patients are going to experience flatulence and stools that have kind of a rotten egg sulfur-like smell. Think of sulfide like sulfur mm -hmm. and that rotten egg or fireworks and yes. kind of sulfury smell. For so sure. this gas is coming from an inability mm -hmm. to very robustly break down sulfur molecules. Mm -hmm. And we know that if sulfur is not properly broken down in the gut, it can cause things like constipation. Sulfur, although most high sulfur foods are extremely nutritious, mm -hmm. they are also very high in an antioxidant called sulforaphane. So think things like broccoli, broccoli sprouts, asparagus, Brussels sprouts. People are always telling you, we dietitians are always telling you guys, eat your greens, eat your cruciferous Kale. veggies, <laughs> eat those crucifers. Yeah. You know, with somebody with hydrogen sulfide and you struggle to break down the sulfur found in those foods, they can cause more discomfort. So right. more gas and bloating because they cause slower motility. Mm -hmm. And they can also, again, have that telltale scent, that malodorous stool, malodorous gas that smells like sulfur. Mm -hmm. So before practitioners would really just be asking patients, how are your, how's your gas? How does your gas smell? The other telltale sign that they would use before this new test came out was to see if there was a completely flat lined hydrogen and a completely flat lined methane result. Hmm. We know, just like I had mentioned with methane consuming hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide can consume both methane gas and hydrogen gas. That's why we put it in this order. You're wondering why, why don't we talk about hydrogen and then hydrogen sulfide and then methane? It's because hydrogen sulfide is like the consumer of all. It's it's really interesting, these microbes that are there creating the hydrogen sulfide. I mean, that's mm -hmm. so cool. Absolutely. So because it can cause that slower motility, that dysmotility in the gut, yeah. again, it's going to be associated with more, more people have constipation with it, but also alternating constipation and diarrhea because you, there's usually involvement. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hinting at is you might have one type of SIBO. You might have two. You could have three types of emo or intestinal microbial overgrowth. They are not always they can happen in conjunction. They and, are not always singular. And emo will make you feel emo, and we get it. This is overwhelming. My dad jokes. <laughs> this is overwhelming. This is a lot of information. We totally get it, and that's why this is education and putting this out there because we love seeing our patients just that light bulb go off, that information go into their head and go, whoa, this makes sense. So we're bringing that to as many people as possible. If you, you need to be working with a care team that understands this, that gets this and can even test for this because it's out there. You should know about this for sure. And it's so vital, you guys, for you to be working with a care team who understands diet because yes. at its root, SIBO is, or EMO is, dysbiosis, imbalance of microbes. Right. How are you going to balance them out? Sure, you might use an antimicrobial, and that can be part of treatment, and that usually mm -hmm. is for our patients. But you also want to feed more of the other microbes that can balance things out. Right. So avoiding fiber long term is not going to always be helpful in trying to rebalance that dysbiosis because fiber oftentimes is the key to help feeding a lot of these other commensal anti-inflammatory species. Totally. Wow. Well, this is great. Guys, if you haven't watched our videos previously, make sure you do that. Uh, next time, so in about in about two weeks from now, we're going to be talking about um, who should be on your SIBO IBS care team. So we're going to get into that topic of what should your care team look like? What, what are some of the maybe comorbidities or other variables you should be thinking about and getting some of these specialists on board on your care team ready mm -hmm. to go so you can have that big picture. It's about the big picture. It's about looking at your root system and the whole tree 
tree and going, wow, this is my, this, these are my issues. It's time to attack them where it makes the most sense. Not just look mm -hmm. at a tiny branch and go, oh, you have some ants there. Let's just kill those ants. Well, no, they're part of a larger picture and ecosystem. And you want to properly uh, assess that ecosystem. And again, we're not about killing the ecosystem. It's about rebalancing the ecosystem. So this was great. You can see Dahlia is amazing and smart and, and beautiful at the same time. <laughs> but thank you guys for joining us. Like I said, in two weeks, we'll be back again live talking about your care team. Subscribe, comment, and uh, we will see you all yes. very, very soon. And remember, if you want us to personally answer your questions, you can always become a patient of ours. You can go to marytelth.com and yes. you can join our Good Gut membership group. All right, everybody, have a wonderful uh, Friday and weekend, and we will see you guys very soon. Bye, everybody.